1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, personal sin, could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, revert sins, confess it, and the Holy Spirit restores you, and he will teach you in this hour. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls, for it is the truth that sets us free not only from our own bad decisions, but from the cosmic system of thinking. It reestablishes into the plan of God by divine viewpoint. We're so thankful, Father, for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in James 1, 5, and 6. You recall that verses 2 through 8 is dealing with the struggle that some of the congregation was having uh, with undeserved suffering. And he talked about it in verses 2 through 4, consider it all joy, brethren, when you, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, which is the trials is about, produces endurance. Huponom, it means patient endurance. And let patient endurance have its perfect result, a perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now in verse 5, you recall from last week, well, we talked about prayer for wisdom. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, notice that the word lack there was just finished in lacking in nothing. It's lepo, L-E-I-P-O, lepo. And, if, and he says you should not be lacking in anything, right? Lacking in nothing. And then he says, he says, but if, and that's a first-class condition, and there are some who lack wisdom. If, if you lack, and, that's a, uh, and, and you do, if any of you lack wisdom, and the wisdom here is the application of cate pertinent categorical, what we call categorical Bible doctrine, to the Christian life. There, you're struggling with something in your life um, that would fall under the category, in this case, fall under the category of undeserved suffering. But listen, it could fall under self-induced misery, it could fall under divine discipline, or it could fall under, that's the three categories of, of suffering in the Christian life. But in this case, it falls under undeserved suffering. And so he says, if any of you lack the wisdom, the application of, of the truth of the Word of God to your life specifically, in, and you're struggling with it, if any of you do lack wisdom, and you do, and you shouldn't, right? You should be lacking in nothing, okay? But if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Then in verse 6, where we are today, he says, but let him ask in faith. And we got the word but here um, is another, it's, it's another uh, trailer hitch off from verse 5, which is off from verses 2, 3, and 4. And so this is kind of like a series of understanding. Let him ask. Here's one of the problems you're having. Let him ask in faith without doubting. See that? Look, if you're going to pray for that, now you're already struggling. And if you're going to ask for wisdom, be sure that you act, ask it in faith without doubting. Right? Because that's the problem they were having. They were having problems with doubting that God could take control of their life situation. There's nothing in your life that God can't resolve. You belong to him. I mean, this is a dependent, a dependency on God, your father. The great struggle, listen, and what he's telling you is the great struggle in the Christian life. Is what God is trying to do with your life and you're pushing back on. The things that God is trying to do in your life, which are going to be positive and good things, all things work together for good. What he's trying to do in your life are very positive, very good, very healthy for you. But because it doesn't fit your agenda, you're pushing back on it. Because you're struggling a little bit with trying to get, wrap your brain around what's going on, and because there is a conflict, doubt always shows a conflict. Please tell me you know that doubt 
You know, is the proverbial horse caught between two haystacks. He's hungry and he starves to death because he can't figure out which one to eat. That's, that's doubt. That's how doubt is. Doubt's, doubt's a spiritual killer. And he talks about that. He said, listen, if you're going to pray, for, listen, you're struggling. If you're going to pray for wisdom, and you should, because you're lacking is the ability to apply, to engage God into your life situation where he can resolve it. Your job is to hold on to the faith, the directive will of God, hold on to faith and let him work it out. And so he says, look, if you're going to ask for that, don't ask doubting. Well, you know, he usually is a, a day late and a dollar short. That's not true about God. Where'd you get that idea? See, that's what doubt says. So he says in verse 6, let him ask in faith without doubting, without doubting, all right, without doubting. That word without in the Greek language is a really interesting word. I, I wish I really had time today to break down the Greek. It, it, the word is mendemen, M-E-D-E-E-N. And it's, it's a compound word. It doesn't look like it, but it's a compound word. It's, it's, it's just a magnificent little word. It means never. It's made up of the word, it's a negative may, M-E, with a negative conjunction, day, with the word one, heis. It's just the most phenomenal little Greek word you could ever possibly do. And it's translated in English without, and it means no, not one, none, never. <laughs> I don't know if without doubt means that much to you. Never doubt. I almost titled my, my page here, but I thought it might be too strong, so I said there's a danger in it. The danger of doubt, a doubting faith. Let him ask in faith. Never doubt God. See, faith, where does faith come from? It doesn't come from you. It comes from God, right? But faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Therefore, faith is as saying, that God, I'm hanging on every word you say, and I'm going to hang on that word. I don't care how the circumstances of my life come out. I'm not, look, you think you're in charge of the circumstances of your life. Today's Sunday. What's tomorrow? You in control of Monday? You know who sets up Monday? God is part of creation. You don't have power over Monday. You can't go, you can't on Sunday say, well, I want it to jump to Friday. You don't have that power. Monday's going to come, and it's going to come because God's in control, and everything in Monday is God ought to be God's control. And listen, your job is to walk it out in faith. And you have to believe that everything that occurs in your life on Monday is good because it's from God. A spiritual person takes everything that God gives them and thanks them. Even when it doesn't fit your agenda. Well, I had, this is what I had planned for Monday. And boy, you get so upset when he shifts the furniture on you. Why do you do that? God has only your best interests at heart. You don't know. You don't know. None of us do. I mean, how many times do you have a, whoops, or on your way and you have an accident or this or that? You never planned for that. That's what's exciting about the Christian life. You just live it out. You know who has to keep changing the plans? You. You. You have to keep changing your plans. If you're smart. <laughs> if you're not, then you'll, you'll wind up in self-induced misery because you'll be making decisions that are really bad for you. And all it does is dig a hole. You know, so 
Self-induced misery is a terrible thing because all you do is you got the shovel in your hand, you took it out of God's hand, put it in your hand, you just dig you a hole. You know, how's that working? So here we are when he says in this text, let him ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Uh, yeah? This is not a little storm on there, on the water. This is a tsunami. When we recently, not us, but when we recently had this big tsunami, paid attention to that, I thought, this is really interesting. And they talk about when a tsunami comes to the shore, they call it a train of waves. It's out there collecting. And by the time it hits the shore, it's a train of waves. They call it a train of waves. And it typically hits the shore at 500 miles an hour, the speed of a jet, with waves topping out at 100 feet or more. It's what it's, it's the momentum of what it's creating. I don't know what you think this passage is about, but this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about when he says, in the danger for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea. See the word it is like? That means a resemblance. It's in the perfect tense. It's what we call an intensive perfect. And it, now we know the perfect tense means completed in the past the results. It remains. But it's the intensity of it. And he compares it to the sea. He compares it to a sea like I just described that gathers up speed and storm and it's just, and it's building, and waves are connecting to waves and building and building and building. When it hits, it is light out speed. That's the perfect tense, what we call the intensive perfect tense, a tsunami. It doesn't have to be there. Listen to what he says again. Let him ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like. In other words, he's a person that's building a case against God. He's just going to go this way. I'm going to do this. I'm, no, I know what God says. Uh -uh. See, doubt means you know. You can't doubt what you don't know. You can be ignorant. You can be ignorant about it. You can't doubt. The danger is don't doubt because it's going to start building waves, poo, 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 and it could hit a tsunami level in your life. Just wipe out. You been there? A person who lets doubt roll on in their life is is like a when it hits the when it hits when it finally hits. It's going to be like a tsunami. Not a salami now. A tsunami. Right. Let me read it again because you still not get. Why are you not getting this? It's just a verse. Let him ask in faith. Because if you if you let the faith life live, the rest of it's taken care of. Please understand that. If you ask in faith, everything else is taken care of, right? Let him ask in faith without doubting, because if you doubt, look what he says, for the one who doubts in the present tense, this is what his life is going to be like. It's like a storm developing into a tsunami. And when it hits... If you don't come out of doubt, that thing is going to build, 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 build. 
boom. So, don't go there, right? Ask in faith without what? Never doubting. Why? Let God be in control. When you get in control, it, when it gets done, when doubt gets through with your life, it's going to go like a tsunami. See, that's the intensive perfect tense of it is like the surf of the sea. And this is the idea of raging. Now, let me show you, let me show you something. James, we, people, people might say to me, how do you know this is undeserved suffering in verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7, and 8? How do you know that's undeserved suffering? Well, we know from Philippians 129, for it is for it has been for you to it has been granted for you for Christ's sake, not only to believe, but to suffer for his name's sake. Suffering for Christ is undeserved suffering. James, James has been addressing a group of people. Look at verse 1, James 1:1. 1, 1. I'm addressing the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. They were being persecuted for Christ's sake. You know, it's hard for me to say that. When I say Christ's sake, I can see grandmother coming with some soap. Isn't that funny? And I've been saved for longer than most of you have been alive. But what I grew up as a swear word. For Christ's sake, you better not say that around Grandma. She ran for the soap. Aren't you glad we quit doing that? I never would do that to my kids. I hated it. I did spank them. I hated that too, but the soap business, that was too much for me. We know because they are being persecuted for the sake of Christ. That's undeserved suffering. James reminds us, as a church age believer, reminds us that undeserved suffering is used by God to test our faith. That's 2, 3, and 4. It's used to test our faith cycle. To test our faith cycle. You really need to learn that faith cycle in the Christian life. He reminds us that it develops spiritual growth maturity. It develops our relationship with God as our Heavenly Father. I, I wrote a lot of information for you down on the piece of paper. I went into a little bit of Greek. One that I'd pull, pull, pull your attention to is the word, let him ask in faith. Would you look at that for a moment on your paper? Notice what that is. That's a present. That P is a present, active, imperative. An imperative is a what class? Please tell me you know that's a command. Thank you. And a present tense is a standing command. The present tense is continuous action. The prayer for wisdom, let him ask in faith. That's a, that's a command. And let me write this, on, write this above that. That's a present act imperative. Agreed? Write main verb. That's an MV. Main verb. That's a main verb. Now I'm going to show you. It's got two participles with it. It's got two participles. Now watch this. This is really good. He must ask in faith. There's no definite article. When you're talking about faith with a definite article, you're talk without the definite article, you're talking about the function of faith, therefore the faith cycle. You're not talking about learning it. You're talking about exercising it. You with me? You walk by faith, not by sight. That's what we're talking about. And there's no definite article with it. Let him, let him ask in faith without doubting. See the word doubting? Notice that's a present middle participle, nominative singular masculine. That goes with the main verb. The main verb, when it's a present tense, and it's an imperative or an indicative, makes it a main verb, either, either one of those, then what you got is the action occurring at the same time. Let him ask in faith, never doubting. See the danger? See the enemy? It, listen, you are the enemy to your own faith. 
right? It's an in-house warfare. That's a present, that, that's a present middle that's reflexive. That middle voice is reflexive. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. That's reflexive. Here's faith. Let him ask in faith, never doubting, and he puts it a present participle. In other words, you ask in faith, no doubting, not, no doubting what, what God has promised you, God is faithful to do, right? Romans 4, 20, 21, what he's promised, he is, he is able to do, and that, that's where faith operates. Uh, without any doubting for the one who doubts, notice this, that's a present mental participle. See that? See, the word doubting is used both times. Don't let doubt begin and don't let it, and that's a present tense. It's a command. Let him pray in faith without doubting because doubt is going to be an enemy of your faith. It's going to create a, a waves that are going to crash, and if you stay in there, it's going to become a tsunami. And when it hits, when it, when it finally, when it finally gets done, and you look back at it, your life is going to be a mess. It didn't have to be, right? We could have asked in what? Faith and never what? Doubting. But when you doubt, faith is set aside, and there's your life. Boom. Get your hands off yourself. You love faith. You walk faith out in your life. You walk by faith, not by 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You walk it out. What God has taught you, what he has taught you in class is the directive will. And what he's revealed to you, you walk that thing out in your life. Never what? Doubting. Because once you get in doubt, sets faith aside. Doubt takes control, and you're off to the races. And when he gets done, <laughs> There's going to be a mess to clean up. Never doubting. So this word ask in faith, it has both, both words of doubting are present participles attached to that word. I say to you, ask in faith, never, never, never doubting. Where's faith come from? Faith comes from God's word, right? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing God's word. When you, that means revealed. When that thing is revealed to you and you believe that, he's going he's gonna to require you to walk it out. You learn the Bible to live it. Right? He gonna, listen, he's going to teach you that principle. <laughs> now, you can do what a lot of people do here. You can go to another church and not have to face this. And, 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 and be oblivious when everything crashes. Because, listen, if you don't ask in faith and you doubt, the same result's going to be, I don't care where you go. <laughs> you understand that? The Bible is the same. It's going to be truthful. It's not going to lie to you. You can sit around and lie to yourself if you want to. It's not going to lie to you. The majority of people who leave a Bible-teaching church like this, listen, they go for all the wrong reasons. All we do is teach it. That's all we do. Listen, if you want to have fun, join a sports club or something. You can have the best of both worlds. You don't have to deny yourself one for the other. The danger of doubting faith is the loss of counting, the ability to count it all joy. Right? That's where we started, wasn't it? Count it all joy. Consider it all joy. Let me tell you, when you get in doubt, the last thing you're going to do is count it all joy. Doubt, doubt tears that because doubt is not letting the word of God be walked out in your life. You've shut that system. You, when you go into doubt, you've shut the faith system down. The faith cycle is shut down. At some point, it's got to go through the whole business. If you stop in one place, it shuts it down. And let me tell you, count it all joy is an aorist imperative. That's a hut too. Count it all joy. No matter what you're going through, count it all joy. No matter what you're going through, count it all joy. Count it all joy. How can I do that? 
God's in control. He's working all things towards good, right? You're not going to do anything bad. You'll do that. Listen, he don't have to do that. You'll do that on your own. Jeez. The danger of doubting faith is the loss of being able to count it all joy when you go through suffering. Let me talk about a few things today. Point number one, in today's lesson text, James issues a warning in a command regarding prayer. He says he must ask, pray. He must ask, present active imperative, that's a command. He must pray in faith. You know what's interesting? That word N E N. If you drew a circle and put the word in, you would have to put a dot in the middle of the circle. Because in means that you're in something. You're in it. You're in it. When we study prepositions, and we teach the pre preposition, the Greek language, we draw a circle, and we put all the different prepositions around that circle, how they, how they work in a person's life. I tell the, this to you very often. The word in, E-N, plus the locative means you're inside the sphere, and the sphere that you're in, the circle you're in, is important to what he's trying to teach you. Listen, sometimes that circle may be the hospital. <laughs> it won't be the morgue, but <laughs> if he's teaching you. But that circle can be a lot of different things in your life. But it, the word in plus the locative means in, inside the severe uh, sphere, the circle of what God is working in your life. So let's take a look at it again. Let him ask in faith. There's no definite article, so he's not talking about how you're getting the faith. He's talking about how you're walking the faith out in your life, right? So he's talking about 2 Corinthians 5, 7. About, he's talking about the faith cycle, the function of the faith cycle, and bring it into a place of completion in your life. The place of completion in your life is when you can count it all joy. So he commands you, <laughs> pray in faith without doubting. What am I praying for? Wisdom. What is wisdom? The, apple, the, the actual application of the directive will, the things that God has tried to teach you in undeserved suffering to develop your life spiritually for what he has you on this earth for. And your dynamics is that circle, the Christian way of life, and he keeps involving you in all kinds of stuff. It's called spiritual growth momentum. James says that doubting faith resembles or is like echo, perfect, intensive, an intensive perfect. I just explained that as a tsunami. If you stay in doubt, right, you're told not to, right? You're told what? Never what? Doubt. Is that a command? Is that a directive will? But and then he tells you, but if you do good in it, it's not going to be good. Because it's going to be like a like a storm that is gathering and gathering and gathering and gathering is going to wind up this way. You if you're in doubt, get out of it. Right? If you're in it, get out of it. Here's the second thing. This word doubt, it's one of five words. It's one of five Greek words. This doubt's a really interesting study. One day I'll come back and I'll do a study on doubt because there are many facets of this. There are many facets of doubt. There are five, it takes five Greek words to explain doubt. We only have one in English. But we have different things like don't be perplexed. Don't be uptight. Stop worrying. What do you mean you can't sleep and can't eat? 
there are, there are a lot of different avenues to this idea. Okay? But the one that James uses here is, is a compound word, dia, that's a preposition, and krano. Dea krano is a compound Greek word meaning to separate thoroughly. It means to make a distinction, to differ and contend. For example, in Acts, the 10th chapter, verse 20, when we have Peter called to go to Cornelius in chapter 10 and 11, the Roman centurion Cornelius, God who, who is in Caesarea and Peter is in Joppa and God is working on both ends for evangelism, he's working with the centurion, Roman centurion, Cornelius over here, to get him saved. He's religious. He's, he's come in to believe there is a one God, but he's not saved. We got Peter over here in Joppa, miles away, and God is working on both ends trying to get the guy who knows, who has the gospel, to get him over here to a, a Gentile who needs the gospel in order to get saved because he's conscious, he has God consciousness uh, for God, and now he has the right and responsibility with God to give him gospel hearing. Are you with me? This is why it always works. This is why we go on mission trips. This is why we walk across the street and talk to a neighbor. This is why we talk to a young person in our class. This is why we talk to guys at work. Listen, and listen, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to talk, you should talk. Because on the one hand, he's working this guy over here told called Cornelius. On the other hand, he's working the guy with the gospel. He's trying to get them both together. However, Cornelius, he's wide open for the gospel. But listen, over here, Peter, well, there's certain people he talks to and there's certain people he don't. Now, if that's, a, if that's a Gentile, oh, I'm not going to speak to him. If that's black, I'm not going to speak to him. If that's I'm not going to speak to him. You know, I live in a different, different neighborhood. I live, I, I'm a different, you know, I got an education. I got this, I got that. I don't cross the lines. You forget that if you're in Christ. You need to go back and read Galatians, the third chapter, 26 through 29. Forget that foolishness. That's not what Christianity is about. That's what prejudice is about and kills you. So he's got this guy over here. He's got a Gentile over here that needs a gospel. He's got a guy on fire for God that's full of prejudice. And he's got to get the prejudice out to get the gospel in. Are you with me? Well, you can read that. You can read Acts 10 and 11. You can read this story for yourself. I'm giving you a cliff note version. All right? So... Here's what he has to do to Peter. Now, he's got this guy already. This guy's chomping at the bits to get saved. If somebody could just come and explain it. I want to be saved. And he's got this guy over here that goes like, well, I've talked to everybody, but, but I had talked to Gentiles, especially Roman Gentiles, right? Oh, come on, people. So what he does, he puts this guy in a trance. Just think what he has to do to get, get believers sometime to do his work. We call it being hit with a two before. He puts him, he puts him in a trance so he can talk to him because he can't talk to him because he's too prejudiced. So he puts him in a trance and he drops his sheet down and puts all kinds of unclean animals, tell him, kill him and eat him. God! Peter goes, oh, wait, hey, is this a trick question? <laughs> I ain't doing that. I ain't ever done that. I ain't ever going to do that. I don't care who tells me, I'm not going to do it. And he says, of God. Oh, well, wait a minute. You know how many times he had to tell Peter, he had to put the sheet down, tell him, kill and eat. Peter went, no way, Jose. He put the sheet back up, let him get back into deep sleep, dropped it back down. 
There, I've seen that before. Arise and eat. I told you before. I ain't ever done it. I ain't ever going to do it. Pulls the sheet back up. Let's him get back in deep sleep. Drops the sheet again. How many times does he have to pull the sheet up and pull it down, pull it up, pull it down in your life before you're going to listen to the truth of the word of God? Huh? How many times did he have to do this? Thank goodness it, 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 the third curtain was the call time. And Peter goes like, the ding. The Holy Spirit, you know, is in Peter's life to teach him. But he didn't need the Holy Spirit because I can tell you right now, I ain't ever going to do it. I don't need no Holy Spirit to prompt me. I don't need no Holy Spirit to tell me what to do. I tell you, I ain't ever going to eat that. And finally, by the third time, the Holy Spirit goes like, da -da. and he goes like, wait, 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 wait a minute. See, here's the Holy Spirit working. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me stop telling God what I'm going to believe and not believe. See, at some point in your Christian life, you got to quit telling God what you're going to do and not do. No, I don't. You can do it your way, tsunami. Third time, that, listen, third time it came down, Peter went, wait a minute. That sheet comes down from heaven to me. Wait a minute. That sheet's not going up from Peter to heaven. That sheet's coming down from heaven to Peter. Now, just what is this about, Lord? Well, I thought you would never ask. Call nothing. Anything I call holy, you call holy, period. Right? That was his lesson, right? Anyway. Anyway. Is that what this exercise is about? Yeah. Because we live in the new covenant, not the old covenant. Come on now. Because we are, I mean, oh, that's the blood of Christ. That's the blood of Christ. Oh, I get it. That's the blood of the cup of the new covenant. Ta da da da. Peter says, got it. Okay, let's see. I want you to be ready. I'm sending some Gentiles to your house to take you back to Cornelius, the Gentile Roman. And I want you to give him the gospel because I got him ready. So when the guys show up, the men that the Roman soldiers that were sent by Cornelius... Peter's ready. He goes with him and brings Cornelius to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He explains to him how Christ died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And Cornelius believed it. And Cornelius said, come and tell all my people. I'm going to have a big meeting. Don't, wait, don't, go, don't you leave here. No, no, no. And Cornelius invites everybody under his command of his household. And we had a revival. Had a revival. This is that, listen to how, listen to how in Acts 20, here's 10, 20, and here's the word doubting. Arise, go downstairs and accompany these men without misgiving. I wrote it in the Greek language so you wouldn't miss it. That don't mean, listen, that don't mean misgiving. That means never doubting. Look at the word, M-E-D-E-N-D-I-A-K-R-I-N-O. That's the very same formula that we have in our text. Same one, right? Never doubting. You get up and you go talk to that, that Gentile over here and you give him the gospel because we're under the new covenant. We bring everybody on the same page. 
Everybody comes through the cross. No man comes to the Father but Christ. But anybody who comes to Christ goes through the Father no matter who he is. Anybody who goes through Christ goes to the Father. I don't care who you are. You come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believe he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. I don't care who you are. I don't care what the world has told you who you are. You come by faith and you get saved like the rest of us. What a day in the household of Cornelius, the Romans. This idea translated misgiving means never doubting, for I have sent them myself. Arise, go downstairs and accompany them without never doubting. For what, what would he be doubting? Well, I wonder, you know, they're Gentiles, and I've been, I've been taught all my life, yes, but we're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. We're under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through the blood of Christ. It's through his work that every man, no matter who he is, comes into the same royalty family of God. There's a message. In Matthew, the 21st chapter, 21 and 22, the same formula is used, never doubting. Truly I say to you, there, there's our deal we know about, truly, truly I say to you. Third class condition, if you have faith, maybe you will, maybe you won't, and do not doubt, maybe you will, maybe you won't, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. I don't know. Listen, people, that's as simple as it gets. And I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from, Auburn or Alabama. This thing works. Or UAB or Sanford or wherever you're from. Montevallo, just in case. See there? The same word, if you have faith and do not doubt, ask in prayer, believing you will receive. You'll receive it on his timetable, but you will receive it. Here's, here's the third thing I want to say. In our lesson text, that's James 1.6, The middle voice is used, the present middle participle with doubting. It's used two times. It's connected to a main verb. You remember I showed you that? Both times the word doubting is used. They're, they're present participles connected to the main verb, which I, I, I discussed to you. But here's what I want to tell you. See the middle voice? Both times the word doubt is used in, the, in, in James 1.6. It's in the middle voice. Now, this is, this is what we call in the Greek language a reflexive middle. And it means the light is shined inside us. It's what we're thinking. It's how we're operating with, inside our own psyche. Are you with me? It's reflexive. It's, a middle voice is reflexive on the subject. And it's something that's going on within himself. Right? Himself. That's important you understand that. The middle voice is reflexive on the subject. And what we have is there is a, a contention in some of the believer's life over undeserved suffering. They're doubting. They're doubting. They're doubting. The middle voice has separated oneself. Watch this now. Doubt, doubt has gotten inside the believer's psyche system, is his, the way he thinks and believes and has separated him from faith. It's the idea of a separation. So that what's going on in him is contention. There's contention in his life, a separation and contention against faith and doubt in him. His doubt has separated him from the faith, the faith cycle. 
He shut down the faith cycle. Doubt has shut it down. And, and he's contending with it. Oh, I know. And if you went and talked to him, I know what the Bible says, but I don't care. I don't, I don't think that's just. I ain't going by that. I don't care. He may not say it that way. Depends on his personality. He may have said it very passive. And, what, and listen, when you're contending with faith, doubt, doubt, you understand they're in contention? They're in contention. Doubt is pushed back on faith. Shut the faith cycle down. Shut it down. And what does, what does, the, faith, what does the faith represent in your life as the directive will of God? Right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, the directive will of God. Is it, and what's the category? Undeserved suffering. Well, this is way too much. I don't expect all of this. You know, I, I heard Ron said he, that we, we, you know, it was granted to us not only to believe but to suffer. And I thought, you know, maybe just a little bit of, you know, uh, but this is way too much. Listen, it's never more, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it's never more than your faith can handle. Never. And with what faith you do have that you're, is enough to, to do the exercise and your faith is enough to get you out of, it, it says, and a way of escape. You're into doubt. I'm into doubt. <laughs> well, your faith, you can pull out. All you got to do is change. Listen, stop doubting, start believing, right? Stop doubting, start believing. Stop doubting. They're, they're both belief systems, right? They're both operating in your psyche. Stop doubting. That's a, that's a thought process. I can't tell you how many people, I can't tell you how many people I talk all the time, they come in, I've got this problem. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, what, what do you perceive the will of God to be in this? For me, that's the direct will of God. Well, I believe this and that. I said, well, then why don't, why don't you do that? Well, I, because of blah, 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 blah. Throw all that away. Get rid of that. Those are all stumbling blocks in your life. If it's not doubt, it's fear. And if it's not fear, it's something else. It, it, it all works off from itself. The middle voice teaches that doubting puts oneself in conflict within himself. Right? Well, I don't want to be doing the will of God. No, but I don't want to do the I don't want to be doing the will of God. But what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Well, I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. Have I knocked on your door yet? Hmm? The mental voice teaches that this doubting has put oneself in conflict within himself both in his conscious and with the indwelling Holy Spirit. And what do you need to do is you need to quit doubting, shut that system down and go back to faith and open that system back up. Agreed? Only you have that power. That's volitional. That's why they're in commands. It's volitional. And God, when you get a correct, uh, an imperative, that's a strong command from God to get out of that and get back where you ought to be. It's a command is a very, a very strong way of saying that. Here's my final point. We'll wrap this thing up. In James 1, 2 through 8, where we're headed, doubting stands in opposition to the application and completion side of the faith cycle. Here's how I know that. We know that they understood because they were being persecuted for the sake of Christ. They knew that. And they were, they were running, they were being dispersed. They, they were leaving their communities because of persecution. And God, and God was trying to do something. Else. Well, I lost my house and I lost this and I lost my job and I lost this and I lost that. Ever since I've come to Christ, my life sucks. You know what he's trying to make out of these people? They, they said that because of persecution, they were dispersed abroad. You know what he's trying to make out of them? Missionaries. He's trying to fulfill Roman. He's trying to fulfill Acts 1-8. Go, you know, go into the world, you know, Judea, J Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. 
listen, God ain't doing all this stuff. Well, I just, let's see how, I can make, how miserable I can make him on Monday. He just seems like he had a good Sunday. Let's just tear up his life and make him miserable. And he sits around all day trying to think up ways to make you miserable. That's not God. You, listen, you can do that all on your own. Listen to Romans 1, 20 through 21. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver. That's doubt. He used it with the ook this time. He did not waver in unbelief. See where you got? When you're into doubt, you're unbelief because it's in conflict with belief. You see that? Oh, boy. Come on now. But grew strong in faith, not wavering, not unbelief, strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he is able to perform. When you look at the faith cycle on the bottom of your page, you can see where that line goes through. You got the hearing and believing on one side, and you've got the application completing on this side. These people knew that for Christ's sake they were being persecuted. They were struggling with that, with all that was costing them. I had no idea when I came to Christ that my life, that he would change my life so dramatically. You know, I just thought maybe a little here and a little there, that would be a little cosmetic. Gee whiz, I mean, you know, for some people it may be cosmetic. For guys like me, it was life-altering changing. I didn't get a little cosmetic fix. I mean, so they understood, they heard, they believed where their problem was, where doubt came in, was the application side, being able to see what all this was about. All of that about. Doubt is, doubt is manifested in Romans 4. Doubt is manifested by unbelief and a breakdown in the faith cycle at some point. You got to go back and fix it and get the cycle going again. Yes? Don't have to sell the car. Just get a new battery. You don't have to sell the car. I went out the other day to crank my BMW. Nothing. Of course, I hadn't driven it in three months, and I forgot to lock it down properly. If you don't lock those suckers down right, the battery keeps working. Don't ask me why. Engineering. One of my kids says, you ought to sell it. Why? Won't run. Well, how could I sell a car that don't run? Well, why would I sell a car when I can just replace a battery? Well, once I get it running, I am going to sell it. My wife said we have a parking lot, a used car dealership. It's time to get rid of them. She says, you could get rid of that new truck you got. I went, oh, I can get rid of my truck. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the study of the Word of God. I pray, Father, we take it into the faith cycle and, and let it flow and, and walk it out. We walk by faith. We hear it. We believe it. We apply it. We live it. We hold on to it until God completes it. There's where fully assured comes into a great meaning. Not doubting, fully assured. So here we stand today, Father, and we praise you for it. Your plan is always the best plan that we could ever have in our life. I pray for the offering today, Father, as people generously give, and we understand your mathematics is the best in the world. It's 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. What we give, we know you maximize it. And we're so thankful for that principle. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.